there. Okay, hi everyone. Great to see you all. And a thank you, uh, uh, Kitrin. Forgive me if I'm mispronouncing your name. That was a wonderful presentation. I truly enjoyed it. And I especially enjoyed your visuals, stunning. Okay, um, I'm going to talk about the AI Collective from a perspective of the AI entrepreneur and some reasons why AI entrepreneurs are so consequential to not only today, but tomorrow, as well as some misconceptions about the AI industry, which includes the, uh, the collective and collaborative uh, organizations. So I'm going to share my screen now and pull up my PowerPoint. I think I've got it here. Thank you. Um, move that, change that. Uh, I don't know what you can see. Um, we see your slide deck. Um, oh, you see my slide deck because I can't I... see it. Okay, from beginning, show slide deck from beginning. Okay, there we go. And I'll move this over here. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm going to talk about the AI collective and the elephant in the room. One important issue that I've come across outside of many of the, the different fields within our larger community is that the entrepreneurs are essential assets to our community and that there is a need to change the misconceptions that revolve around not just the AI uh, industry, but the uses of AI, the ethics of AI, and the future of the human in that regard. So the AI industry is a complex system, and that's a given. It has a feedback loop. It's constantly evolving and changing. And yesterday's news is tomorrow's possible future and the past. It's constantly changing. It's a, almost a flip-flop on itself, whether you use uh, refer to narrow AI, strong AI, AGI, machine learning, etc. The main issue here is that no matter what area of AI one is involved in, in the research of it, the uses of it, the ethics of it, the solutions that it can bring about, and the perspective that we will probably continue merging more seamlessly and deeply with AI, it's a benefit to all of society. The mistaken assumptions about longevity industry does include AI based on the biomedical inferences where AI is used to sort code as with Craig Venter to being used in numerous laboratories just to sort out the information, the data on patients. The errors in thinking that I want to identify are the anthropocentric approach to those of us within the larger field of AI and the humanities, which includes the socio-political economic structures that we are building and changing. Another issue is the inference that there's a capitalistic corporate structure that is indifferent and has a disregard for privacy and security. And finally, the mass appeal of turning a blind eye to the elephant in the room, which is that an AI collective can build a safe ecology uh, through numerous different types of systems, whether it's just plain AI or advanced AI with nanotechnology. Success is the goal, there's no question about that. But in order to have success, we must identify the elephant in the room, the bullshit, the false information, the misconceptions, there's a need to change these. And the only way to do it, in my view, is to speaking out, being sincere, and engaging the naysayers and those who have presented misconceptions by offering rational thinking, scholarship in our information, and firsthand information. Experience, what we experience and how we express it to others is often far more important than quoting someone who we think is famous or someone who we think others will pay attention to. It is that one-on-one -on -one heart to heart sensibility that often triggers the emotional um, commonality between humans. 
The individual achievements that many have made within the field of AI are known, going back to early transhumanists, Marvin Minsky, of course, Hans Moravec, Ben Gertzwell, Peter Voss, David Kelly, and many others in the field who are working. Looking at Nell Watson and her work is extremely diligent and looking at solving problems. How can we use AI when we're looking at big structures within the economic systems? How do we build new economic structures that look at some of the issues, the wokeness of today and the countercultures of today and the misinterpretations and often um, misinformation in academics, which I face on a daily basis. So if we sponsor and um, truly support the individual achievements, they in turn will make the larger achievements um, far more substantial. So what I wanna talk about here is that the AI entrepreneur assets include proficiency to achieve, wow, that's pretty amazing right there. It's a proficiency and it could be an innate characteristic or it's something that's a learned behavior. The ability of entrepreneurs to grasp, to grok the bigger picture. Where are we headed? How are we getting there? What are we doing right? What are we doing wrong? How can we pivot or change? With a focus on the end goal, which is success, finding solutions to the human condition, to share our knowledge and to improve performance. The complex systems of intelligence must be seen as an adaptive system. Oh yes, certainly it's exponential, but it's adaptive. And that adaptive system is where all the variables come together like a conglomeration of bacterium. And in that conglomeration, there'll be certain mutations and certain variables that went out and change, but we don't know all the answers. And the aim is to search, to question and find possible solutions. People's needs and rights, the availability of assets, societal needs are included as necessary variables or components within the system of success. So AI collective entrepreneur assets. Number one, core issue. We need to make it clear, more known, that being an entrepreneur is a good thing and that we improve or raise the um, benchmark on the possibilities for standards of living, uh, driving success across societal and environmental systems and improve products and services. Actually, it's those entrepreneurs, those creative thinkers that bring the product or the, the um, project, the process together and put it forth in a way that people can invest in it. And if people make money from it, so what, that's fine. If they don't make money from it, that's fine too. The aim is the end goal, which is a continuous process of achievement. Core issue number two, the AI industry, like other industries, looks at innovation for improving the marketplace. Many are concerned about automation and losing their jobs to automation, but I look at it differently. I see that the industry of AI and automation will create new jobs. And providing these new jobs, it also manifests fascinating opportunities that we haven't even recognized yet. But I think David and team have, have an inkling of understanding of where this could be headed. And that, of course, of course looks at our economic systems and helps us build new ecologies for economics and the growth of markets. Now, markets here are not necessarily based on monetary means. By market, it's that traders, that feedback and control of, I have something you need. Here, what will you pay for it? Or what will you barter for it? Or what will you exchange for it? Altruism and benevolence are very much located and have been very much a part of learning and not necessarily academic institutions, but the field, the industry of education and learning. The third core issue is the advocacy for AI Collective as an open exchange. And you've discussed open systems as far as open source, open code, but I hesitate there. We've seen hacking just 
two major incidents recently over the past month of hacking get into systems. And we've also seen incredibly beneficial um, businesses and, and ways to bring about open source, mainly by Ben Gertzwell. Open source is a good thing, but also we need to be very careful about it and set up some guidelines for it. If you're contributing to an open source algorithm at the back end of AI, whether you're using Python or whatever system that you're using to build out code, it's very important to test drive it. So my suggestion here is that in any open source collaborative AI system that we, we invest in the play of blue teams and red teams and white teams without having the blue, red, white teams part of the process, part of the structure, part of the business, part of the interaction, it could go astray. So in um, instilling the red team, blue team, white team protocol, there is a better way to test, to look for vulnerabilities, to find out who may be not playing fair and to error correct. And so I'd like to introduce that concept to the AI collaborative that there, my suggestion here is to include um, maybe some competitions or some just play fields or interactions where the, we do have teams. And um, I think that would be a really smart thing to do. My experience with that is I've been on the uh, host or chair of several um, West Coast and, and um, multi-national um, red team, blue team um, competitions. And I see what goes on behind the scenes. And it's probably, I equate it to skiing down a, a ski slope in Telluride, one of my favorite things to do. It is so exciting. I watch these students look for the vulnerabilities and find them, identify them, and then the white team trying to get to the white team who are like the counselors uh, who know what's going on and, and have all the answers to the problems they're trying to solve, but don't communicate. It's exciting to watch. So I hope that that does become part of the AI collective. So even with that, there continues to be a need for an open exchange within a closed feedback loop. So we have open source, good, that's great. Need um, to have some team uh, effort there with the red team, blue team, white team counseling. And to look at it as a potentiality for a closed system because a closed system can continually improve on itself and it self-regulates like in cybernetics, feedback control, and anyone can participate. Also within the closed system model, any type of mutation that is disadvantageous to the system and as a whole can be removed from the system and any new integer or variable that can benefit or improve the system can be included. So I'd like to counter some mistaken assumptions. And this goes to the AI industry um, as a collaborative system. Um, the, I mentioned these, but I'm just going to fine tune them uh, in my closing here. The, we need to take a look at why um, transhumanists, life extensionists, AI researchers and advocacy are often considered anthropocentric in their goals, not looking at other life forms uh, and especially the environment. And that is, is a, a true mistaken um, assumption. Um, there's a great concern for the user and the user's privacy within the field of AI and AGI. And the machine ethicists, while they may be like bioethicists and put their moral code prior to ethical legal processes, um, there is a deep concern of how AI can help clean up the environment and make life better for people. And this certainly um, rings true with the X Prize and Peter Demandis and many working in that area to bring AI as a, a system to help. The core issue number two is that AI is somehow sequestered to capitalist Silicon Valley corporations or any uh, parroting of Silicon Valley, which we have across the planet. Uh, not so. Uh, 
it's it's never been part of any structure for a corporation that's using AI to say we're going to be um, mongers of an economic system that overweighs other systems. It's all about the marketplace trading and feedback and control, supply and demand. And if there's a demand for a product that's AI, collective can produce, then that is given. But it is more about supply and demand and people's needs than is about any type of corporate structure or any type of economic structure. The third issue, sorry, is turning a blind eye to the fact that AI is has been and will continue to merge more seamlessly and aesthetically with human biology. And whether it is AI or AGI, a strong AI that works with nanomedicine to for, um, improve a health and longevity, it's here to stay, it's not going away. So we need a better understanding in how to um, be meme breeders of inviting people to discuss that and um, address the continuous claim about overpopulation. Um, we had thought that had been put to rest, but it's not. It continues to dominate the media. Well, the facts are as simple as this. Population probably will begin freezing in the next 10 years. Uh, birth rates are definitely unequivocally and proven evidenced to be declining in many countries in Europe. And Japan was one of the first countries where that was noticed. Uh, and there's some concern about a declining birth rate. And while people are living longer here in the United States, every day 10,000 people turn 65 and will for the next uh, few years, it doesn't mean that population is growing. It means that we need to better have AI work with this um, demographic of older uh, population so they can be healthy and learn about the um, collective and open sourcing of AI to um, build out better environments and better lifespans. So in conclusion, rather than turning a blind eye to the issues of poli uh, politicizing and polarizing and pulling in economics and, and struggling and wrestling with all these things. We need to open our eyes and make these claims known to be better pontificators and prognosticators of the fact that those of us in these fields of AI who've been working with AI research for decades as I have been with my metabrain, uh, which was the tertiary brain developed in 1996 with Marvin Minsky. And um, I have to say that Elon Musk's uh, Neuralink kind of picks up where my metabrain left off. His engineering skills far exceed my visionary ideas. And it's wonderful to see that, but we need to open our eyes and pay attention to what's going on around us to get out of our little clubs and hubs our political or social systems or um, group think to expand and understand and invite and welcome people by education. And I think here education is the key in helping everyone understand the future. And in closing, I'll say that Humanity Plus um, had uh, a project called Longevity Innovator Foresight Entrepreneurs. And I wanna add David Kelly to this. Um, because I think David Kelly, through his work for years, I first spoke at one of his events in, in um, San Francisco at Microsoft Lab, and at, um, the Richter Lab or Writer Lab, I, Reaction, Reactor Lab, Reactor, thank you, David. Yeah. It was wonderful, I loved it. And I met so many fantastic people. And to see the work that you continue to do, I am transhuman, I think set the stage for uh, a standing up opening our eyes and saying, yes, I am transhuman. And it reminded me of the transhuman manifesto that I wrote in 1983, where I says, I am transhuman, that went out across our solar system on board the Cassini-Huggins spacecraft. So David, my hat's off to you. I applaud you and thank you for your leadership and advocacy of AI. Thank you. Thank you, Natasha. Let me ask the audience, uh, do you guys have any questions for Natasha? 
I have a question. Uh, and first of all, thank you, Natasha, for your presentation. And this is with regard to the misconceptions about AI and AI entrepreneurship that you identified. And I agree that these are misconceptions. I am wondering about your thoughts regarding perhaps some cognitive dissonance that occurs in many people's minds when they think of terms like capitalism, uh, because what you described, uh, for example, with regard to entrepreneurship, mm -hmm. with regard to innovation, markets, supply and demand, generally those terms have a positive connotation in mm -hmm. many people's minds, which is why you were using them. But for many of those same people, the term capitalism has a negative association, even though the sum of those aspects that you described is essentially capitalism going by the strict definition of that term. It seems to me many in the general public who critique capitalism are conceiving of it as something else, more like the uh, Okay, I'm gonna stop you there so I can just answer quickly. Right. Okay, Janati, that's a, a great question. You know, in my mind, it's almost like the term capitalism is on par with eugenics. Eugenics had nothing to do with Hitler. It had nothing to do with Nazis, had nothing to do with World War II. Eugenics was a biotechnological term for looking at the human genome or genomics and looking at the, the, the chromosomal link and what's going on within the gene, the communication of genes. Capitalism is about uh, monetary structures that work with bartering or product or supply and demand and within the marketplace. It has nothing to do with corporate quote unquote greed. And uh, you identified that quite beautifully. Thank you, Janati. So I think it's the term capitalism has been overused and misused. And I think that if we tone it down and, and speak more um, forthright about supply and exchange, um, human needs, um, getting into the marketplace, uh, finding avenues or channels of delivery, much like Buckminster Fuller did with his world game plan, which I think is was a wonderful design and a, and a, a welcoming a humanistic approach. I think we can put the term capitalism aside for the moment and let it regain, let it rest and regain some substantiality and, and use it later on. Um, it's, it's sad fact, but the wokeness is here and, you know, Let's not turn a blind eye, it's here. So the aim is to be careful. I would like to add that uh, Natasha, you are totally right. And I avoid talking about also capitalism because the word has a lot of meaning. Like uh, you said, uh, euthanasia, eugenics, many of these words. So when I ran for the European Parliament from Spain uh, in 2009, I always said, I am not from the left, I am not from the right. We transhumanists, we are from the future, from the future. And so this distinction from the 18th century about left and right is so obsolete. It's from the 18th century, 19th century, not from the 21st century. So, so I don't like to talk about that. We are transhumanists. We think about artificial intelligence, super longevity, super well-being. Well said, thank you.